this week on The Communicators, a discussion about the Commerce Department's role in helping consumers prepare for the transition to digital television. Our guest is Meredith Atwell Baker of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. And today on The Communicators, we are going to talk, amongst many things, about the uh, conversion to digital television. And uh, we are going to look at the Commerce Department's role in it. But first, to kind of talk to us a little bit about a hearing that took place uh, concerning DTV is John Egerton. He is with Broadcasting and Cable. He's their Washington Bureau Chief. John, there was a hearing this week. What happened? Well, Pedro, it was uh, with a, a year and change until the uh, switch to digital television. The House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee and the Telecommunications Subcommittee had essentially a DTV transition oversight hearing where uh, they're concerned that they don't want uh, you know, constituents with pitchforks and torches coming at them if they can't get their TV signal. So they just want to make sure that the transition education program and that the DTV uh, converter box coupon program was, was proceeding apace. And if you had to generalize what kind of questions were asked and what's the general sentiment among the legislators about the status? Well, I, I think they had a, a lot of questions, uh, particularly a, a, about the, uh, the education program. Uh, they were concerned about uh, the uh, uh, DTV hard date, which is, is different, actually, for uh, different kinds of stations. Uh, full power stations will be uh, cutting off analog on February 17th, but a lot of the low power stations and translator stations won't. And even some full powers may actually be pulling the plug a little early for technical reasons. So they wanted to try to get a sense of how the education campaign might deal with you know, different dates and, and also uh, deal with different constituents like uh, minorities, seniors, uh, and, and rural populations, people who would be, uh, tend to be over-the-air viewers more so than have cable or satellite. Who uh, testified this week? Well, uh, Meredith Atwell Baker, who is the acting head of NTIA, and uh, Kevin Martin were basically the uh, lead-off hitters in this hearing, and they, between them, are responsible for the technical side of the DTV transition and the converter box coupon side of the transition. And then there was another panel as well? Yes, there were, but the, the other stakeholders and the, the leaders in that were really, I would say, uh, uh, Kyle McFlarrow, uh, David Rare, who head up the uh, cable and uh, broadcaster associations. Uh, a, a lot of the questions went to the first panel because the FCC and NTIA are really sort of in, in the thick of it, and particularly NTIA, because they're dealing with the converter box program, which is the one that will make sure that all the analog-only viewers can still see a picture after February 17th. And as far as the actual program is concerned, uh, coupons have already gone out. As a reporter who follows this and uh, from the testimony today, what's your assessment as far as what's gone out? Well, I would say there was actually some good news today for uh, Meredith in that uh, Nielsen says that about uh, 13 million U.S. households are analog only, and, and that's down considerably from a GAO study back in 2005 that put that figure uh, at about 22 million. So that means that they will probably need fewer uh, uh, converter boxes than initially thought. I, I would say, from from what I heard, the uh, the uh, legislators were fairly happy with the, with the uh, progress of, of the converter box program and with the basic education program, which is that you know there is a transition coming. They were more concerned about the details of the education program so that different people would would know what they would have to do to still see a picture. John Egerton is the Washington Bureau Chief for Broadcasting Cable. Thanks for your time this morning. Oh, uh, you're welcome, Pedro. Meredith Thatwell Baker, uh, as far as the education program is concerned, you heard John Baker saying that more, or John Egerton saying that more people are being educated uh, as we stand today, about 370 odd days till the transition. How are we doing? We're doing great, uh, Pedro. We are really thrilled that we've had such a large interest in the program. So far, we've had 2.6 million applicants for almost 5 million coupons. And we think that that means that the education is program is working and that the word is getting out and people really know about the program. How much, and when it comes to specifically your role and your department's role in the education program, how much money is being spent on it and what exactly does that translate as far as how people are being educated? Well. Our role at the Commerce Department is the coupon program, not the digital transition at writ large, just the coupon program. And we have $5 million for the consumer education pro uh, program. But remember that we're the federal government. We have 15 federal 
departments that are our partners, and we're working with the Department of Health and you know HHS for their administration on aging. We've got the Department of Education. We've got the Department of Agriculture, who's going to help us with their food stamps program and their school lunch program. Um, the Veterans Association has, administration has been wonderful. There are 24 million veterans, 7 million which are involved in the hospital program, and 1 million which go through their doors every week. Um, we really have valuable federal partners. Um, we're the public-private partnership of the DTV coalition is over 200 members strong and I really think because it's voluntary people are really stepping up and they've pledged over a billion dollars for consumer education about this and I think it's working I think people are getting the word out and um, people know about it and we've got a whole nother year to go our coupon program as you know started on January 1st we started accepting applications we actually are just going to start mailing out the coupons this coming week because we wanted to make sure that there were boxes on the shelves so that people could use their coupon um, and we're going to go through March 31st 2009 and so as far as going back to the education do you produce commercials do you do it through the web how do you do it as far as actually telling people about your role and how they get a coupon we're really le leveraging our partnerships so we're, we're using both our federal partners as well as the coalition to get the word out we've worked with um, Ketchum as we've hired them to do our consumer education out outreach and they have developed our you know our our program materials in, in multiple languages um, English and Spanish as well as you know seven other languages are, are our materials are available in and we're working with them really to target the vulnerable communities which we see and which all information says are the minorities the rurals the low um, the low income the minorities rural <laughs> low income disabled and seniors so we're really focused on educating those vulnerable communities so that we can get the word out to them there's a website attached to this what's the address www.dtv2009.gov and is that the primary way people can get a coupon uh, that is the pri that is that's right. We also have a phone number one eight 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 DTV two thousand nine. That's up up twenty four seven. It's um, English and Spanish both, as well as we have one hundred and fifty languages we can call you back on. On two parts of of this discussion, when they call or they the internet, what do they get in return? As far as what a what a coupon looks like, what are they going to get? Well. I happen to have one right here. So um, it looks so like it, an ATM card or something It looks like, that. like a gift card. It was designed to look like a gift card. Um, we did 17 focus groups across the country. You can hold up a bit. Um, consumers like red. They felt very good that we would have the Department of Commerce insignia on it. That gave them some security that actually was the government. Um, the hologram, obviously. So this this is the coupon card. It looks just like a gift card. You can you know, slide it at the point of sale. It's got a bar card on the back with some numbers to call if you have any trouble. Um, so they'll get the coupon they'll get two pages really the first page will have the coupon and it's in English and Spanish as also um, it'll have all the local retailers that are participating we're trying to make it as easy as possible for the consumer and the second page really ask, uh, answers frequently asked questions as well as lists the converter boxes which the coupon can go be applied towards so what do they do with that what do they do with that mm -hmm. well you know we have 250 retailers that are participating over 16,000 brick and mortar locations um, we're pleased that the largest consumer electronics stores as well as the mom and pops are participating um, we have an online online retailers as well as you know folks that are going to be able to accept the coupons by phone so um, you know starting off next week uh, the, we are really grateful to the largest which are Walmart, Radio Shack, Best Buy and Circuit City all of which are ready they have boxes on the shelves they have trained employees they can accept the coupon we had a pilot test in two cities one being here in Washington DC and I actually used my coupon two weeks ago and it was flawless and seamless so we're ready to go so in return and you brought an example of what they're going to get but it's it's one of many I guess but in return this is what they get exactly what is this I'm holding or at least what does it do <laughs> that is a converter box it takes the digital signal and it converts to analog so for those, remember that this program is only for those viewers who have old television sets, analog television sets, and receive the signal free over the air. So your viewers on C-SPAN, well, they're watching cable, so they don't need this box. Um, but for those who are watching over the air, they can use this box, and um, it will allow them to keep their old TVs, and they'll keep working after February 17th, 2009. So how much would this box normally cost if you go to and you didn't have a coupon? Um, well, they're costing. We thought that they were going to cost between fifty and seventy dollars. This is the very first of this project. Uh, this product, Congress gave us the specifications, and we had a rulemaking, and we developed this particular. You know, when we first got them, they were about the size of a 
a VCR, and they, they emitted so much energy you could practically toast marshmallows on them. So I think it's a credit to the industry that we now have this small box that is, is really incredibly um, useful. And so, um, you know, we are pleased with the 37 models that we have so far certified. There's a variety of permissible um, uh, there's permissible f features in the box. Some that have a smart antenna, some have an expanded um, program guide, some have Energy Star certification, some have you know a low power pass through so that you know low power uh, analog pass through so that you can watch low power stations and translator stations. Um, all of those are permissive features, and so we've got a range of product that's going to be available on the shelves for the consumers to choose. As far as uh, there were concerns, I guess, among elderly, among minorities, among especially about actually not only how they can get this, but I guess what happens and how to install that. Is somebody going to teach them how to put that, how to install this? Well, I think it's really important that um, trusted intermediaries um, help elderly. I think, you know, it you know, lots of elderly are afraid of anything electronic at all. So we are partnering with HHS and the Administration on Aging to to help educate this group. We may actually have folks go into, you know, Meals on Wheels, actually go in and help them attach the box. But I think it's important for all of us. <laughs> I call on everyone to go out and help your neighbors, help your parents, help your grandparents. Um, I think that we can do as much as we can here in Washington. But television is personal, and so I think we all need to, we need to work from up here, but we also need to work down here. So I ask that everybody help educate. And do, are they laid out basically the same? I mean, if you would turn the back, it looks like something that most people uh, know as far as installing information, as far as audio, video, uh, cable, hookup. Are they all this simple? They're all that simple. They were designed to be very, very simple, and um, they come with a pretty comprehensive you know, it's a one-page comprehensive uh, installation guide to them. You know, you can call up our 188 number and we can help guide you through. It's on the web. Um, uh, Consumer Electronics Association has done a really nice video that, that everyone's linking to to show you how simple it is to hook it up. Again, it... It, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for the consumers. The legislators this week at the, the hearing that you appeared at, they had some questions concerning not only the specific coupons, but the boxes themselves. On the coupon side, I think it was Representatives Markey and Dingle asking your department for maybe a, an extension as far as when people can apply for coupons, at least giving them a 90-day extension from when they initially apply from. What's the story behind uh, that uh, concern and that request from them? Well, we got a letter from them, but I've heard this concern. I think as we move from a theoretical program that we've designed on paper to one that we're actually implementing in reality, there's some sentimental concerns, and you know these are real people with real concerns and real constituents. And I, I agree. The the um, legislation was designed that each household can have up to two coupons and that they expire within 90 days. Um, what they have asked is that at the end, sort of at the end of the cafeteria line, after everyone's gone through with their plate, if we can put people in the end who have either lost or let their coupons expired without being able to get the box. Um, we, we have committed to look at the redemption rates as soon as, you know, how many people, it's interesting how many people are ordering these coupons, but it's going to be really interesting to see how many people actually redeem them. So as soon as we start seeing the redemption rates, we will uh, we'll take a look at this with those members of Congress who are concerned. Why is it interesting to you as, as far as wouldn't it assume that the people who took the effort to order them would also redeem them? Well, we think, especially from the numbers and from the beginning, it's that we had a big spike our first week. We're just not sure, but there could be a lot of cable and satellite uh, homes who have ordered these coupons who don't need them. There are some who might, you know, walk into a store and see the prices of digital televisions or are pretty, you know, have come way down and they may want to buy a, a cheap digital television as opposed to buy a converter box. You know, people can make this transition in many different ways. So we think, um, you know, we just don't, we don't know what the redemption rates will be. Do you think people understand that they can make a, a variety of ways? We're trying to get that word out. Um, I think, you know, all of our messaging is, is the same, which is that there are three ways to make this transition. You can either subscribe to cable, satellite, or another pay television service, or you can buy a digital television, or you can get a converter box, and if you get a converter box, we stand ready to help you with our $40 coupons. <laughs> uh, one of the other concerns that came from the legislators as far as c coordination efforts are concerned, and I think one of the requests was the establishment of some type of interagency task force to kind of overall kind of see what everybody else is doing in the process. What do you think about that proposal? Well, I think we probably already have that. I mean, we have 15 federal partners that we're meeting with on a regular basis, so I think while we haven't dubbed it, you know, and rolled it out as the federal t task force. I think we actually already have that. Uh, but then you have questions concerning that, and even requests from the legislators. If you have that, or at least you think you have that, why do you think they're still asking for this kind of thing? Because they're Congress. 
when they can. <laughs> and also, uh, this also goes back, I guess, to uh, uh, last year, a GAO report came out. And it kind of talked about, uh, I guess, who's in charge, I guess, if you had to boil it down, really. Uh, do you think those concerns are still there from the release of that report last year about the various agencies uh, involved and who's uh, kind of coordinating these efforts? The GAO does a terrific job, um, but their fact-finding was based up until August, and we did not even sign our contract with IBM until August 15th. So um, I'll be anxious to see what the next GAO report says. Uh, as far as the boxes themselves are concerned, I guess one of the questions I think that were brought forth from your testimony dealt with the issue of low-power televisions, and you kind of mentioned this already, uh, could, for people who don't know. Uh, what is a low-power television, and how does it kind of factor into this whole discussion about the box? Well... At midnight on February 17th, 2009, all full power broadcast channels are going to switch to digital. That excludes, uh, specifically, because I think they might have asked for it, low power class A and translator stations. So there are parts of the country, we don't exactly know where the viewership are, that people will continue to broadcast in analog. We have a permissive feature in our boxes so that we can work with the low power and the class A and the translator viewers and would let their viewers know that they need to buy a converter box that has an analog pass-through feature. We have four so far. I actually have sent a letter out to the manufacturers and asked them to again reconsider this important audience and I think we have over half a dozen letters of intent for more boxes to come through with the analog pass-through feature. Why not install the analog feature at the beginning when the boxes were starting to roll out? Well it's a permissive feature because not everyone is going to need it. Um, one of the people that testified uh, was uh, a gentleman named Ron Bruno, the Community uh, Broadcasters Association, and he talked about this. He, and he said there were three of the uh, 30 boxes that were certified by your agency with the pass-through analog uh, signals. And he said, albeit in a manner that will likely lead to consumer confusion in installation and use, you sat there probably heard this very same thing. Uh, how would you respond? Well, there are actually four because Magnavox was certified the day before the hearing. Um, and I think that there, um, you know, again, I think it's up to the Community Broadcasters Association and the Translator Association, all of these individual stations, and we are working with them to help them craft their message. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning that Congress gave us two other programs. Um, one is a conversion program and one is an upgrade program. We have $10 million, of which I think we've had 260 applicants for our conversion program to give each one of these program, uh, each one of these stations $1,000 to buy a, a digital converter that will convert the digital signal to analog so they can continue broadcasting it. And really importantly, this is the digital transition. So Congress gave us $65 million for an upgrade program to allow these, these stations to upgrade to digital. And uh, overall, What's the cost of this program to taxpayers as far as the conversion program? Or uh, your, I, probably more honestly, your role in this. What's the total cost? $1.5 billion. And is that enough? That, that, that excludes these extra programs here. Okay, so it's $1.5 billion. Uh, for the coupon program. For the coupon program. Mm -hmm. And plus what you uh, talked about previously. Mm -hmm. um, where is this money coming from? Uh, this is coming from the sale of the spectrum that's going on right now from the 700 megahertz auction. And uh, I think this was, as you recall, I think this was part of the Deficit Reduction Act of 2005. So the first $7 billion of the auction goes to the Treasury for deficit reduction. And then there were multiple grant programs, including interoperability and this coupon program and several other programs that we have that we're administrating. Do you this. think that the money that you have originally slated for this, is, is it enough? Um, by all indications, um, on our original economic analysis as to how many coupons we were going to need, we felt that it was sufficient, and we still feel that the amount of money that we have, we have 33.5 million coupons to distribute, and we think that everyone who needs a coupon is going to have, have an ability to get one. And is there an avenue that if, if you needed more money, could you go back and say, look, we, we've had this sale of Spectrum, we have this pot of money, can we get more in order to make sure everybody else is satisfied? I think that's up to Congress. Um, when you look at the, the overall uh, program, what do you think about, I guess, public sentiment about having to do this in the first place? I guess you hear from people about why in the first place do, do we have to make this move? I, I, you know, that's a really important question to get the answer out. Um, it, this 700 megahertz is very prime. We use, always use the, front, the term beachfront property spectrum. And so um, for a long time, the law was that if 85% uh, or more of the country received their television via a pay service that they would have to move. 
Well, because of the Deficit Reduction Act, we actually changed that. And we said, you're going to move on February 17, 2009. We set a hard date. It's very important to know that 24 megahertz of this, seven, of this block of spectrum is going to go to first responders. And so first responders are going to be able to interoperate. So when things like Hurricane Katrina or Rita come along, when nine, this was actually a recommendation of the 9-11 Commission, that this get this 24 megahertz to the first responders as soon as we can. So I think uh, it's important for the next generation of American innovation and the next generation of wireless broadband, certainly, and that's what we're seeing in the wireless auction right now. But it's also really important to the first responders. When you explain to someone that they're really helping America, both our competitiveness as well as our first responders, I think, you know, it's, it's our duty as, you know, civic Americans to all pitch in. And, and it may be inconvenient to go get a box, but if it's going to help out the policemen and the firefighters, I think we're a little bit more willing to do so. As far as the boxes are concerned, when you get these requests, are they coming from mainly rural areas? There, you know, during the first day, which is we had a, a tremendous response during our, the program in the first, the first week, the first day we had res, uh, requests from all 50 states. And uh, I would say if there's, if there's anywhere where we're probably getting more um, requests, it's along um, the border, I think. Uh, Texas and California are both very high uh, applicants. And the only reason I ask is that I suspect that most people in urban areas have the option to go to cable or satellite in order to, to avoid buying the box or getting the box altogether. At this point, our records show that 46% of the applicants are over the air only. So, and so when uh, so the, when you get the coupons, you can you how many coupons do you get again? Up to two. Up so to some, two. Pe some people are, some people are ordering one. A lot of people are ordering two. Um, as far as the actual uh, transition, when people ha actually go and buy boxes, you mentioned the stores, but when can they actually start getting them? Well, we're going to start mailing out the coupons this week. So mm -hmm. the fo those folks who were first in line, they're going to get their coupons early. We think we'll probably get through our backlog. You know, obviously we have almost 5 million coupons to get out. We think we will get through the backlog by the end of April. And then people will, will be receiving their coupon within two to three weeks of ap applying. Um, so as soon as you get the coupon, you can go to the store and get your box. And what's the, how many stores are involved in this process as far as retailers are concerned? Well, um, we're going to start, we're starting off with, we wanted to make sure the retailers were trained and that they had boxes on the shelves. Now that we know that we have nationwide providers that have boxes in each one of their nationwide stores, we're, we're rolling this out nationwide. Um, there are 9,000 retailers that will this week have that are trained, certified, and actually active in the program. That number will, you know, keep going up as we as the and the number of boxes out there, will, the inventory will continue to increase as the program reaches its peak. Is it specialty retailers or generic retailers? Uh, Walmart, Best Buy, Radio Shack, and Circuit City are our initial participants, which we're very grateful for their leadership. But we have 250 retailers from, you know, mom and pop stores to nationwide retailers, brick and mortar. And the only reason I ask is that uh, it was, I think it was last month, I think it was the CEO of uh, Walmart, or not Walmart, um, Best Buy. And he said this, he said the number of converter boxes that's going to be required could put tremendous pressure on us to solve all those problems. We're very nervous about the potential risk. And I guess he was talking about enough demand to meet, uh, enough supply to meet demand. I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think, you know, it's a first time program. So I, I think we're all a little nervous. I mean, it's never been done before. So, you know, but we're all holding hands and taking the step together. So from now until transition day, what's your job and what's Commerce Department's job? I know actual delivering of coupons, but what are you doing, I guess, to oversee all this? <laughs> well, we are doing a lot of this. I think as much word as we can get out, I think it's really our job, particularly in our vulnerable communities, to, to get the word out. So we are doing as much outreach as we can to, you know, the constituency so that people will know about this program and, and avail themselves of it. And so, again, just for, for purposes of uh, for information, they can call what number? 1-888-DTV-2009. And if they go to the web, what number can they call? Uh, or or what, w uh, what's the address? www.dtv2009.gov. A um, few minutes left, if I can ask you about something else that uh, the Commerce Department put out. They put out a report last year, or last month actually, looking at broadband in the United States. This was called Network Nation. What's the purpose of this report? Well, as you probably know, the president had set a goal for us. It was universal, affordable broadband access by 2007. So when to the end of 2007 came, we had to do something. And truly, um, if you look at our time in the administration, from the very beginning, we've had a comprehensive set of policies that will enable a robust broadband market that we're enjoying now. So I really thought it was important to enshrine the policies that have led to our robust 
broadband environment. So it, the report is not so much about the goal. I think a lot of people are focused on the goal. And the answer is, by many metrics, yes, we have met the goal, but we have much more work to be done. But what we really wanted to do was shift the focus to the policies. So it's really about both the technical, the regulatory, and the economic policies that have led to this robust broadband environment. And as far as each of those arms of the policies, what's important to know about all the, those three? Well, I think as far as techno technical goes, um, net neutrality, we've made a, an awful lot more spectrum available, both you know licensed and unlicensed. Um, economics, don't tax it for certain. That's um, That's been a very important policy that I think has led to this. And regulatory, as long as we can continue to remove regulatory uh, burdens on this industry, then they will continue to grow. So we are really pleased where we are, but I'd like to, you know, say that this is just the start. You know, we're just now getting the AWS spectrum into the market, and we're just now auctioning the 700 megahertz. So this is the start. You know, we made broadband over power lines. We did 10 million tests so that we could notch the frequency so that broadband over power lines could actually roll out. I think we are at the start of this, not at the end, and we still have a long way to go. Um, and you know, as long as we continue these policies, we are in good shape. You had said that people focus on the goal rather than the, the policy. As far as the goal is concerned, what is the goal as far as uh, the, the policy of the broadband in the United States, at least the government's policy? Well, the goal that the president had set out was universal affordable broadband access by 2007. But people forget about the second part, which was in competition thereafter. So I think it's really important to continue this, these policies so that we'll have a multiple platform co uh, competition. Uh, Meredith Atwell Baker serves as the Acting Assistant Secretary of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. That's a long title, but thanks for being on The Communicators. <laughs> Thank you, Pedro.